Welcome to The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight into basketball. My guest today is L. Greg Smith, and he's the managing principal for Best Talent Management Strategies, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate you having me. No problem. So, um, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college. So, where'd you go to school? I attended Seton Hall University in uh, South Orange, New Jersey. All right. Great. So, uh, let's go back into high school. Okay. Um, when did uh, college recruiting start for you? Was it freshman year, senior year? When did it all start to begin? Probably between uh, freshman and sophomore year. You know, I attended uh, Plainfield High School uh, my freshman year, and then I transferred to Seton Hall Prep as a sophomore, and I played uh, basketball and ran track. And then from there, you know, I started to get some interest in the track actually first, and then, uh, but I liked basketball. And uh, being right on the campus, which is where the prep school was located at the time, I had access to a lot of college coaches, not just the ones at Seton Hall, but the ones who would come through when there were university games or they were recruiting other players. So probably between uh, those two years. Okay. And uh, how many schools were recruiting you? Did you get recruited by a lot of schools or just Seton Hall? Nah, no, it was probably about 15, 20, you know, Division One, Two, and Three. Uh, I actually chose Seton Hall because I liked the uh, business ed education that I was able to get there. I was quite honestly familiar with the university, uh, being that I'm born and raised in Jersey. You know, my dad worked at the university actually for a while when he retired from the uh, police force in the army, and it was a good environment. So uh, that brings me to my next question, which is uh, mom and dad. Were they involved? Was it, uh, was it there a lot of support there? There was always a lot of support, but they gave me the flexibility to make my own decision. And one of the things that they wanted to make sure is that I would be happy where I was and you know I wanted to major in business wanted to uh, have an opportunity to play you know I, I was a walk-on but more importantly uh, was the academic component and at that time Seton Hall was one of the few business schools that was fully accredited and based on my major as a marketing professional uh, it worked well for me. Oh, fantastic so now you're at Seton Hall University um, how's the practices what's the what's the whole uh, concept of basketball at Seton Hall University? Well, it's challenging, you know, because you, know, you have to balance your, your time. So I would say the most important thing would be time management. You know, you have, uh, and depending on what your major is, that can even be more challenging. I was a business major, so we had classes that sometime would run right up to practice. You know, we have other uh, projects that would be due, you know, in one or two days. So, you know, you come from a practice or you come from working out, you're tired, you eat, you fall asleep, you still have to study. So. Uh, the biggest challenge there is, is to manage it and still do well in school and perform at the same time. Uh, I always prioritized education and actually decided after my first year uh, not to continue playing because, you know, I was a double major. I was a uh, marketing finance major in the uh, W. Paul Stillman School of Business and the workload. I was taking 18 credits and it was a bit much. So at that point, I decided to, uh, to focus on the ap academics. Wow, fantastic. So now... Tell me a little bit about the university. What is uh, Seton Hall University all about? Uh, you know, a Jesuit school, you know, very strict at some point. Um, I had a, a long history there, uh, going there, uh, being on campus when I was in high school. So I knew a lot of the faculty, I knew a lot of the administration. It was a great experience. You know, people uh, really care about the students. Uh, since I've graduated, which is a while back, uh, the university has grown tremendously based on some of the, uh, the contri contributions made not only by corporations but the, the success of the athletics, particularly baseball, uh, basketball, and track. Hmm. Now, uh, you said that you uh, stopped basketball after your freshman year. Right. Um, what was the decision-making process in that? Well, it was tough, you know, because I wasn't able to perform in either one the way I would like to. You know, and I didn't think I was going to the NBA at the time, although I did have a tryout uh, once I graduated, but uh, I decided to focus on the studies. You know, I had uh, some interest from uh, several corporations, IBM, Xerox, AT&T were the primary ones at the time. Uh, and actually, when I graduated, I mean, I was working for Xerox a week later. So they kind of had their eye on me, and I had their, my eye on them based on the fact that I wanted to get into sales and marketing. You know, the Xerox uh, sales and marketing program is world-renowned. Had an opportunity to go down to Leesburg, Virginia, be an instructor, and I took advantage of that. Wow. So now, how do you go from uh, college to where you are today? How do you become the managing principal? 
Well, I, you know, I worked at a lot of different corporations. I had some really good training, worked for some good people, uh, worked for some not so good people. So that kind <laughs> of, uh, you know, led me to want to have my own business. I've always wanted to do that. And, uh, you know, that's something that I've had as a goal is, since I was a kid. And fortunately, based on some of the training, some of the relationships I've consummated over time, it's allowed me to get into an arena that I'm able to help a lot of people. So when I founded this organization, I had come from a similar group that was a lot larger, that we did some of the same types of services, you know, leadership development, outplacement, management consulting, and sales training. So I was able to develop uh, additional new relationships while uh, benefiting from some of the ones that I had worked with. So some of the clients that I had worked with for the past 20, 30 years had some of the same needs, but they wanted to work with people that they knew. So it afforded me the opportunity to step out and do what I do now. So give us a little background on the business that you do. How does uh, best talent management strategies work? What's the actual um, description of what you're doing? Sure. So we have uh, about 15 uh, people that work with us. They work in consultative uh, capacities in different areas. So the primary uh, revenue streams that we do now come from leadership development, executive coaching, and outplacement. Mm. Uh, sales training, although while it's um, fairly cyclical, is also a very lucrative business, but depending on how the economy is and what the needs are of specific businesses, that can fluctuate. And typically what happens is we, you know, we go out, we make sales calls, you know, it's done via email, telemarketing, LinkedIn, uh, sales visits, again, leveraging the relationships that we've had over time and securing business where there's specific needs. Interesting. Very interesting. So um, give me a sense of um, the type of people that come to you. What, what are the type of uh, customers that you're, you're dealing with? Um, you, you were saying before, I'm assuming uh, big organizations. What, what type of organizations? Yeah, well, actually, we're, we're pretty diverse. You know, we, we work with some of the larger organizations. We also work with mid-size and small companies. But I would say probably 90% of the revenue that we have comes from mid-size organizations. You know, because in many cases, we're not able to compete globally with the, the very large firms that do what we do. Mm -hmm. But conversely, there are some people at the C-level that we have relationships with that are able to identify what we do and what we do well, and then we are able to secure those opportunities. So um, do, you, uh, do you still deal with uh, basketball players? Do you have any basketball uh, adventures that you, you have out there? We do. Adventures? We do. Uh, I guess on a more informal one, you know, I actually coached AAU basketball for about 15 years. You know, my son played, and uh, it, was a, it was a blast. I mean, we are able to help young men and women, you know, realize what their dreams are, whether it's to, you know, play in college, uh, play in high school at a high level. And, you know, we had one gentleman that actually went to the NBA last year, first round draft pick. So, you know, it's rewarding to see the development, not only athletically, but academically, spiritually, socially, et cetera. So uh, as part of that, you know, it's, it's kind of like an offshoot uh, of, from my corporation. You know, we uh, give back. So we've worked with a lot of individuals that have played at different levels that are also willing to give of their time and expertise in order to help these young men and women, you know, achieve their goals. So do you, uh, do you delve into the basketball entity of, uh, of uh, skills and things like that, or do you deal more on the, the business sense of what's going to happen when they get to college, the MBA, anything like yeah, that? Yeah, well, sort? we typically start out when they're young, and we focus primarily on just being a good person. You know, we use that as the foundation. Uh, we came up with a model. We came up with an icon, actually, that we call the sun guy because the sun rises every day. So we figure that's something that people can relate to. And, you know, we basically came up with uh, different components. You know, the sun guy respects everyone, helps others, maintains discipline, uh, keeps an open mind, practices peace, enjoys life, and gives light and hope to all. So we use that mantra as our foundation. And then we focus on the skills of the game. But we teach life through the game by using the, the mantra that I just described to you. And that's worked well for us because, you know, the demographics are, are very diverse that we work with. You know, we work with a lot of urban kids, work with a lot of sur suburban kids, all different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, all different lifestyles, uh, full family, single mom, single dad, sometimes no dad, no mom. So, wow. you know, but we basically put everybody together, uh, try to make everybody a good person, and we do that through teaching the game. You know, we've done uh, global community service with the student athletes, we've been down to the 
Bahamas three times, done service down there, played in tournaments, uh, been to uh, Bermuda twice, uh, along with Coach Bob Hurley, former coach of St. Anthony's. And we've been up to Canada a couple times doing the same thing. So the experiences that these young athletes have achieved together has not only made them successful on the court, but made them successful in life because they're learning uh, various life skills that, that have been helpful for them. So um, if, if there's a student out there looking for something like that, where, where do they go to find something like that, or did you find them? Yeah, well, it's, it's some of both. You know, based on what we've done, obviously there's a lot of exposure positively that comes from that. But sometimes, you know, I'll be at a game or I'll be at a tournament and I'll see a kid, or some of the kids, I've seen them on the playground, and we just go start talking to them and, you know, establish a relationship that way. But the main thing is to get them doing productive things, to get them out of the streets, get them in the classroom, get them in the gym, and start to work with them. And then based on the experience and success that we've had, you know, a lot of people have also come to us. So, you know, we've been blessed to have uh, a lot of corporate sponsors. We've been blessed to have people in the community have taken interest in what we're doing and, and be able to help these people. Great. Now, now uh, the type of kids that you're, you're developing, what, where are they uh, usually coming from? It's just the urban areas they're coming from? Um, no, they come from everywhere, actually. You know, they, do. Uh, they come as far north as uh, the Bronx and as far south as Philadelphia. You know, but most of the kids are Jersey kids. But we have kids from uh, Somer Somerset County, Union County, Essex County, Warren County, Hunterdon County. Those are the primary ones. You know, we focus on, on Central Jersey just mainly for logistics. However, we play, you know, all over. I mean, we play all over the country. Wow. And, and uh, grade-wise, what do these kids need to, to, for grades? Um, yeah, can, we, they, can they... Can they be just a C average student? No, nah, we, we try to keep the standard above a B. You know, we, we've had a couple C students that have really struggled, but they haven't had, unfortunately, a lot of the resources at home. But we've been able to take some students that are struggling and actually turns them into, turn them into dean's list students at their respective uh, prep schools, high schools, universities, you know. In another case, uh, we've taken kids that are in a public school that maybe the academics weren't as strong. So we've uh, had good relationships with some of the prep schools in New Jersey, Rutgers Prep, Seton Hall Prep, uh, Gill St. Bernard, Immaculata. And we've gotten these kids, provided they could do the work, and we help them with that, yeah. uh, into these schools so where they, they'll receive a good education and at the same time have an uh, opportunity to excel on the court or the field. You know, a lot of the, uh, the athletes we have play other sports. So right now we've got, uh, over the years, 23 Division One players about another two or three hundred uh, Division two II and three players. Some of them play baseball, uh, football, and of course basketball. And so, we actually have two soccer players now. So now how, how early do you start with these kids? Uh, are they in sixth grade, seventh grade, or do you, you get everybody in the, the, the high school level? Type? No, some of them actually we had since the very beginning. I mean, we've had some of them since you know, first and second grade. Wow. We've had others join us as late as their junior year. So it, it kind of varies, but, but typically the goal was always to try to keep good players together, not only to play, but to learn and to grow. And it's nice because, you know, a lot of these young men have graduated, but they still stay in touch. I mean, there's people on the other side of the country, but these guys are still Skyping and playing Xbox on, yeah. on the phones and things like that. So it's a lot of fun to watch, but, you know, we, we're confident that they'll develop the same kind of network that we have. And that's important so that they can in turn give back in the next generation. And now uh, the NBA guys that, that get drafted, that they get involved and come back and, and help as well? It, well, they have. It's a little early because it's only been one year. But uh, from a mentoring perspective, absolutely. But what's also good to see is the work that they're doing for the NBA through the NBA CARES program. You know, if you go online, you can see the work that they're doing there. And it's pretty much analogous to what we've done. Really, that's that's fantastic. Now, um, the college, the, the the colleges themselves. What uh, what do you see in basketball at, at the college level? Um, what's the take from when you went to school to what you see now? Well, I think now everybody starts a lot earlier, and it's a lot more organized. You know, uh, a lot of times recruiting back in the day was done from the playgrounds. You know, in New York it was Rucker Playground, in Philly it was the Baker League, and Jersey was the Jersey Shore. And while those venues still exist, the AAU venue has pretty much dominated the recruiting uh, playing field for all, all level coaches. Yeah. Uh, it's very well organized. I mean, a lot of people are against AAU. I think it's a great opportunity, provided they're with the right program. 
And what do you see in AAU? What's, what's, the, what's the concept behind AAU, and why do a lot of college coaches go to them? A lot of games, that's the main thing. But I think the, the reason from a recruiting pre uh, perspective that college coaches flock toward AAU is because they can uh, maximize their time investment, meaning you know, time can be the best or worst enemy of a recruiter. So if you go to a fairly large AAU tournament, you're gonna see a lot of really good uh, talent, good competition, and you're gonna see it all at once. So as opposed to going to a high school game two or three days a week, mm -hmm. you can go to one AAU tournament one day and see several hundred kids wow. at the highest levels. And, and uh, they're all over the country, or is it uh, yeah. th these tournaments uh, just in one particular part of the country? No, they're all over the country. You know, the bigger tournaments are, you know, there's a lot down in Florida. There's some in Pittsburgh, uh, Vegas, Milwaukee, Jersey. New York and Philadelphia, those are the primary, and in Los Angeles, those are the primary markets for these bigger tournaments. But there's a lot of AAU, the, what they call the AAU circuit, uh, runs the whole country. And, uh, and the type of kids that are going to the AAU teams, that they start as early as 7th and 8th grade, or are they yeah, even some earlier even, than that? Yeah, some are even earlier than that. Some kids, you know, again, depending on what their background is, don't start playing until later. But the kids that really do well have been playing a long time. They've been well coached. They've been taught the skills. They behave well, and uh, and they're playing with good programs that have good teams, good exposure, and uh, that that brings scholarships. And do do kids move from team to team, or do they stay on the same AAU team all the way through? Yeah, most school? of the kids move around, which which I don't think is a bad thing because you know sometimes they'll have a, a, a good experience and they can go somewhere else and have a, a better experience. You know, it's just like they do in the NBA. I mean, because in AAU a lot of the success is predicated on winning. So if you go to these big tournaments and you lose the first game, so now you're playing at a different court, different bracket, you could be playing out in literally like the woods someplace as opposed to playing on the main court at the big gym, at the big university where most of the scouts are going to be. So a lot of the kids, no matter how good they are, they want to be on a winning team. And a lot of teams are stacked, but that's okay because, again, the ultimate goal is to help the, the kids, is mm -hmm. to help the student-athletes secure a scholarship or some type of placement and be well educated. And do they find, uh, is there a, a high percentage in scholarships that you get from, from an AAU team? Yeah, I wouldn't say it necessarily comes from an AAU team. I think it's a collective experience between AAU, high school. I mean, I think one of the, the things that could be improved is that the AAU coach is working more collaboratively with the high school coaches. You know, a lot of the high school coaches are against AAU, and most of the AAU coaches are really just trying to win and try to help the kids. Mm -hmm. to, to the extent that, though, they can have a more collaborative relationship, it helps the athlete. You know, some of the players in the NBA now that are doing very well have had good high school coaches, good AAU coaches. They've worked collaboratively. The, the player has gotten better, and it's benefited everyone. And do you, do you see with a lot of the uh, parents out there, that once their kids get into AAU or in uh, high school basketball, it's all about basketball, they forget about the studies? Well, that happens sometimes, but I think the parents nowadays, to, to their credit, are a lot more savvy because they realize that there's more to life than just basketball. And I think more importantly, they realize the odds of, of going to the NBA. I mean, it's like one in a thousand kids, and not to mention what can happen in terms of injuries and things like that. So. Most of the parents nowadays, while they have dreams of being having their, their children play in the NBA, they're more realistic. So therefore, they also understand they have to be better prepared. The other thing is with the NCAA guidelines, there's certain criteria that are necessary for student athletes to participate. So the parents have to be aware of what they are. They have to be well-educated, which is actually one of the things that we do. That's one of the services that we offer, mm -hmm. not only the, the, the AAU itself, but the education of what the process is like and yeah. what's required and what type of work has to be done over time. You know, it starts with the grades. I mean, and we've always had a strong um, work ethic in terms of, you know, making sure that our student athletes are good students. You know, and, and that basically comes from the way I was raised. I mean, you know, if I, if I weren't a good student, I wouldn't be doing anything, you know, and my kids are the same way, so. So what happens you, you're an athlete, you go to college, you did one year, you left. What happens to the scholarship money, the money that you're playing for basketball, 
does that all go away and then you have to find a way to just continue school? Well, in my case, I had an academic scholarship, so it didn't go away. And that was a good thing. And, uh, but in some cases, yeah, that could go away. So again, what we profess is that if, if a student athlete is a good student first and they can get athletic, I'm sorry, money for their academics, and then basketball or whatever other sport they're playing is secondary, then that helps them a lot more. The other thing is at the Division two and three levels, <clears throat> they don't offer full scholarships. So therefore, you know, now they can have a full scholarship combined between academics, athletics, community service, you know, which is another component that a lot of people miss. I mean, there's many schools and universities have, you know, a different organization that will give money uh, based on a community service participation. So that's something that we have always been strong advocates are because it, A, it's the right thing to do. B, you're, you're making a good productive citizen and it's another way to get more money. So now, how about the uh, students that they're just C average type students? Do you, do you tell them to go to more of a community college type before they go to a big four-year college? No, I, I'd rather see them improve academically. You know, there's help out there. So whether it comes from their parents, whether they, you know, join like a, a tutoring service, they get help from their teachers at schools, they get help from a sibling, other student athletes, you know, we're, we're proponents on going as high as you can. And for someone who just can't do it, then yeah, the secondary options are always good. That's better than nothing. But the first thing is because most people can do the work. I mean, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the educational systems aren't doing what they're supposed to do. So as opposed to penalizing that student who really wants to do well, but perhaps doesn't have the resources, mm -hmm. let's first try to get them the resources and then uh, and do it that way. Great. And, and, and um, there's so much uh, out there for, for kids for basketball. Yeah. Um, what, are some of the, uh, what are some of the pitfalls that you see in basketball? Um, you know, you always hear about kids, you know, going one year and then getting out. Uh, you hear about uh, people getting cars at the high school level. Uh, are those some of the pitfalls that, that you see in basketball? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the pitfalls, and it's not mentioned enough, it's, it's sad actually, is some of the bad coaching. You know, I mean, there's a lot of really good coaches and there's a lot of uh, not so good coaches, we'll say. Uh, and I, I realize that that's, in some extent, subjective. But there's a lot of really talented people that if they don't have the right coach, they don't have the right opportunity. So, for example, let's say you have a kid who's 6'3", six, 6'4", six, in sixth grade, okay? And he's the biggest kid on the team. Well, a lot of coaches will have him play with his back to the basket because now... He's the biggest kid on the team. He's expected to get the rebound. But in essence, if that kid doesn't grow anymore, he goes to the next level. He's a guard, but he has no ball handling skills because he wasn't pro coached properly. So one of the things that we try to do is we try to teach all the skills to all the kids because you never know how it's going to end up. Plus, that's the way the game is played now. The other, another big pitfall is some of the political aspects that happen in all levels, you know, even as low as middle school. You know, people who get involved with the program some of the times are not as experienced or don't have the foundation or they're even a work ethic to make the programs or the athletes successful. So when you get good players around bad people, it's not a good combination. I would say those are the catalysts of probably 70 to 80% of your problems. Of course, there's, you know, people who have behavioral problems and things like that, but, but that's like anything in life. Yeah. But I find that for a lot of these kids, the sports are a good outlet. And if they have good guidance, they have good mentorship, and, and they're taught a good work ethic, then they can usually do very well. Even if they're not the best person out there, they learn the game, they learn life, they learn how to respect other people, how to treat people, and they have opportunities. And, and people that are, that are looking to find you, they find you online? How do they find you? Yeah, I mean, most of it's through networking. I mean, I know a lot of people. Uh, some of it's online. Sometimes you'll be at a tournament. You know, I've gotten a lot of players over the years where we've actually played against the team, and then the coach will come up to me and say, hey, good game. And then that parent is, they see you, you know, after the game and say, hey, you know, like, can I have your business card or where you guys based out of or I like the way you coach. Uh, and I've had some go the other way too. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where, I've always just tried to help the kids out, you know, and, and I don't really care where they play. Good. Well, good. So uh, we're coming to the end of our show. Okay. Uh, usually I ask my guests, um, what advice you want to give to the parents out there that their kids are playing basketball and want to go to the next level? Yeah, I would say the, the first thing is uh, make sure that they enjoy the game. They should be playing the game because they enjoy it, because they, they're passionate about it. 
The next thing, obviously, is the uh, emphasis on academics, uh, being savvy with the way they are in terms of uh, just being good people. You know, now with social media, it gets a little tricky. You know, a lot of times people make mistakes. They don't think when they're communicating. So that's something that we, uh, we emphasize because, you know, sometimes you make those mistakes and you can't erase them. So, you know, that's something that we have to be cognizant of. But the main thing is to enjoy the game, do well in school, uh, be cognizant of how you communicate, how you treat other people, and, and work hard. You know, nothing is going to be given to you. And again, it's, it's difficult to be a professional athlete in any sport. I don't care how good you are. It's just, it's very challenging, very rewarding. But if you can put those other things together, regardless of what happens, you'll be successful in whatever you do. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time.